Okay, go. Aloha. My name is Agnes Kainor Rice. I was born on the island of Hawaii, in the district of Puno, in the Ahupua of California. I was raised there as a youngster until the age of uh, eight, when we moved from, this, from California to Pahoa, which is a plantation town. Kupuna, do you have any stories or personal experiences concerning when the white people came? That, I really don't have much, any experience concerning the white people. At that time, during my, uh, I was growing up, the only white people that I know was my uncle who was married to my aunt. And through him, we got to learn to speak the language, but uh, I mean the English language, because his my cousins when they come to visit us, they only spoke English. But when I was growing up in, in California, our language was only the Hawaiian language, because we lived with my grandparents then, and we only spoke Hawaiian then. Went to school, they taught us a wine. Went to church, we only spoke wine. So therefore, very little English was spoken to us until, until during the summertime when my aunt would come down with my cousins, and they're the ones who spoke the English, but we knew very little English. Yeah. Did you, um, did you ever get busted in school for speaking Hawaiian? Well, as I say, we lived in Puna, in California then, and everything was Hawaiian day. Go to school, we learned Hawaiian, go to church, learn Hawaiian. When my father was over, was offered the position to work in the, in the plantation. Uh, so we moved from California to this plantation, which was called Papua. And when we moved there, that was my first, what you call, uh, experience of seeing other kind of nationalities. There we saw Portuguese, we saw Japanese, we saw <laughs> Filipinos, or Chinese we knew because we had Chinese family in California. And then okay, this, the Lunas, which are the bosses of the plantations, they are the white people. Now, it was rather confusing to us to see all these different types of people. Now, when we were enrolled in school, when we enrolled in school, my first day there, it was, oh, it was something like a hard day. Because I really didn't want to go to school. My mother had to take us to school. Oh, we were all crying because of it what kind of situation we were going to get into. All right, sitting in the classroom, the teacher came around and she was asking everybody's name, what is your name? So when he came to me, he spoke to me, what is your name? I, I didn't know what she was asking. But luckily, I had befriended a friend, my next door neighbor, who was Japanese. And she kind of helped me out with the English. So she turned around and she told me in Japanese, Anata namai nani desu, which means, what is your name? But because I knew my name was Hawaiian then, I gave them my Hawaiian name. I said my name was, at that time, was Khalil. And the teacher didn't want that. She says, no. Because she knew what my name was because on account of on the birth certificate. But she said she would not accept that Hawaiian word, the Hawaiian name. And so that left me kind of dumbfounded and I didn't know what to do. Okay.
Well, what was your original birth name? Uh, my original name when I was baptized. Uh, no, your birth name, your first name. My first name that was given to me when I was baptized. My first name was Catherine. Catherine Halili Howell. Leo. Of course, that's my father's name. My name Agnes Wright is my married name. My Agnes Wright is my married name today. But as uh, my surname was Catherine Kalili Hawaleo. I'm speaking about going to school in Poho. First few days was hard. When I would meet my brother, we would speak Hawaiian. I think the kids would turn around and tell the teacher that, oh, she wouldn't speak Hawaiian, you know. And so the teacher would get after us, get after me, he says that we're not allowed to speak Hawaiian. And of course, I would forget myself, and I, now and then I would answer in Hawaiian. So, this, so what she did, as she punished, I was not the only one. As she wrote on the blackboard, he says, I will not speak Hawaiian. So she tells us that I know what she's saying in English. Saying, I want you to fill up this blackboard with this writing. And at that time also, my writing wasn't as good then, so I had to follow her writing. So when the board was filled, then she would excuse me and I'd go home. Well, this thing happened so often that I thought one day, I would be smart enough. I would write big letters instead of the small letters. So I would extra big the letters. So when I did that, that tail of the backboard blew fast. So the teacher says, oh, that's wonderful. You did a good job. That's good. She said, now, I want you to fill up this other board. So I said, oh, no. <laughs> I thought by me filling out the board would have been enough. But she wants me to do the other board. <laughs> so instead of writing big letters, I went back to the small letters. And she approved that, so I, I left. But she asked me. In the meantime, my mother had been waiting for me. Had been waiting for me. As she always told us, when school lets out at 2.30, all you go, you and your brother, come straight home. But this day, because it was after 2.30, she wondered where I was. So anyway, here I come, I come home, and I saw my mother sitting on the porch. So I said, hi, Mom. Before, before she even said hi to me, she gave me a whack with his stick that she had in her hand. So I was so frightened, I said, What's, what's going on? So she went on, she said, didn't I tell you when school lets out, you come straight home? I thought, I'll try to tell her. I said that I was punished because I can't, uh, we were not allowed to speak a wine. I had to write the words on the blackboard and she didn't believe me. But luckily, my brother was home and he said, that is the truth because we were not allowed to speak the language on the on the ground or in school. Okay. So my mother says, okay. When you come home, you speak the Hawaiian language to me. When you go to school, you learn the language there. And so we said, oh, it's hard for us here. So my mother said, okay. So that's the beginning of us learning how to speak the Hawaiian English. So we had to study the English language. It took me almost a whole year before I mastered the how to speak the language because I can say, I said, oh, go come my house. Oh, I stay go. Really broken English, you know, stay come or go play. <laughs> Never a perfect English. So that's how we spoke these days. It is go stay calm, go play. Go stay eat, I stay eat, things like that. How did Hawaiians 
have their religious system structured? Well, to be truthful, I didn't know of any other gods except this kind of God that we were, we were taught. But years later, I found out that the Hawaiians had their own gods long before Christianity, long before the missionaries came. They had four different gods, and each of these gods had a purpose on the universe. And they were Kani, Ku, Kanalo, and Lono. But to me, then, those days, I had no idea what it, what it was about. Yeah. Until as we got older, we found out that the different gods had different purposes. But when the white people went cook, captured this island, uh, arrived in this island here in, in 78, that's the first time the white people ever set foot on this island. Okay, years later in about, this is all from the books now, uh, years later in about 1820, the missionaries came, the white people came. And the missionaries were sent over here to, to convert the Hawaiians into Christianity. Because along the line they heard that though the the Hawaiian people here were heathen people, that they they were worshiping idols. So anyway, they did come. Well, they did a pretty good job of con trying to convert the Hawaiians into Christianity. Uh, some of the Hawaiians, they had to abolish their idols, because in those days they worshiped their idols. Many of the idols were destroyed but some of the poor people way out in the country, they hung on to their idols. They hid them. They, they even, uh, they did not give their own, their own customs away, but they hang on to them. This is according to history, as I say, because in years later, they, what you call, they came back. Now, about, about these different gods, you know, King Queen Kaamanu, she converted into herself into Protestant. Yeah. She she became a Protestant. But to what we understand, that when a Protestant came, other religion came into, such as the Catholics. Catholics. The Catholics came and they had the statues. They had the like the Blessed Virgin Mary and the different saints. And they had these these uh, um, statues in the church. So when the Hawaiians, some of the Hawaiians saw these figures in the church, because they believed that they used to worship their own gods, their own idols, a lot of them turned from Protestant to Catholicism to Catholics, and they were worshiping these these gods, not knowing that there is a one God. Now, that's, now, history has lots to say about that. Okay. How did the Hawaiians perform funerals? How did the Hawaiians perform funerals? Well, that's, that's kind of a tough question, yeah? In the old days, how the Hawaiians is, I remember as Hawaiians in those days. We didn't have a we didn't have a much worry as we have today. All I know that when a person dies, we have in our little community, we always have carpenters, painters, so what this is in a plantation now. And the plantation people, uh, the carpenters, would build out the coffin for you. They usually take the measurement of the person. And they build this coffin out made out of uh, lumber, which is about one by twelve, yeah, about one inch wide and about twelve inches uh, long, whatever you call it. And they would structure it just like a coffin. I mean, just to fit the person. And for a lining, and they would line it with black material. So when that's done, then it's taken to the house, to where it is, 
and the body of this person is laid in in this coffin. But I know with us Hawaiians, usually a Hawaiian blanket, a quilt, is put into this, is, uh, is laid into this, uh, in the casket, and then the blanket is folded over. In other words, to keep it warm, so they say. I know that my father died, he had that. He had his suit on, and he had his blanket, and it just covered up to his face, you know. Oh, but his body was kind of really purple, and I had no idea then how they kept the body out for one week. And later on, as I found out, they embalmed the person, they embalmed the dead person with salt or with what I have no idea. Okay, now, in those older days, when a person dies, the body is left in the house, in the house, usually in a parlor or one nice room or whatever, where people can come in and go out, you know. Now, lots of people those days, the houses were far apart from one another. And most of the houses down in California have to be fenced in. And the fencing is with uh, rocks. They have stone walls. They have stone walls around your, your, your compound or where you live because if you don't have any stone wall, all the loose animals could come into your yard. So all, uh, all homes had stone walls around the gate. And when people come right from the gate, they begin to start crying. And this is what they call um, the lament, lamentation of the, the Odi. And they, they start crying from the gate, and they're walking their way through the house. And while they're walking and crying, they are telling the story of the person that they know. Yeah. And it's really what's called weird um, when you hear them chanting. Until they get to, to where the house is to the coffin, and there again they chant and they cry and they all oh, wail and whatnot. And when they get through, then the owner of the house, she would respond back. So all through the day and night, people would come and different people would tell the story of what they know of this person. Yeah. That's the kind that I, I know. And to us kids, we'll, well, sometimes we see that, we'll cry, sometimes we get so scared, sometimes we'll be hiding, you know, hiding behind an older person. But if it's your own family there, you've got to sit nearby. What about the story when your sister died? My sister, now, I don't know if this, if this is true, but my sister took very sick. All of a sudden, she took sick. And that, how she took sick was because my father and my mother got into a fight. Well, I guess from drinking and they got to arguing, and from arguing they got to fist to begin to fight with one another, holding my mother's hair and beating her up. And at that time, my mother was pregnant. And this is what my father said to my mother. He said, that the baby that you're carrying is going to die. The baby that you're going to carry is going to die. And this came out from his mouth. Okay, it didn't take long where my sister, she was about seven years old, to very sick. And this sister of mine was my father's pet. Because she was a pretty girl. My mother would comb her hair into curls, you know, and she, she was really pretty. So she was very sick. Nobody knew what was wrong with her. They went to a kahuna, they still don't know what was wrong. Well, finally they did find out that it was kind of too late already, too late, because my father has already said that the baby was going to die. The baby was going to die. Okay. Now, I have an aunt and an uncle who lives about a mile away from, my, from where we live, 
And they were out on the porch in the late evening, sitting down, and finally they heard somebody say, oh, Hello, goodbye, Auntie. Can you hear that? He said, she said, Hello, goodbye, Auntie. And then she saw mom, and she said, Bye-bye, Uncle. Yeah. So when they heard this, mom said, First was mine, she said, oh, so loud and clear. And she thought, what was this? And what was mentioned to my, to my uncle, bye-bye, uncle. Both of them were surprised. So they said, oh, something must be wrong. And they knew this girl, this boy. Yeah. Everybody knew who she was with us. So she said, something must be wrong. Let's go down and see. So when they came to the house there, my, they saw my father was holding my sister, and her, she was way, her hand in the back was waving. And while she was waving, and her last drop, and it dropped, and then she died. And so my auntie and uncle saw that. So I, I said, believe that she had called them, told them that she was dying. Okay? What about the story about your grandma? Now, my grandma is another story. Where we have our cemetery, I said, is way up about three miles away from where we live. Well, at one time, my grandparents lived way up nearby the mountainside. Yeah, they lived because their tarot patches were close by. But I don't know, somehow from there, then they bought this place down near the beach area. So they moved down to where we are, where I was, where I was raised in Kalapala. Okay. Well, anyway, when my grandmother died, they had to take her coffin up to this area, which is about three miles away. And my grandmother is a big lady, so her coffin was extra big. And it took four men to carry this coffin. Now, to go out to this trail here at one time, the trail was just made enough for a single car or for an animal or a horse or for one person out of this trail. But in order to take my grandmother to the Kulikum, they had to clear this path. They had to clear the path. Okay. Okay, so on the way up, Everybody was going, the coffin was ahead, and some people were ahead of us. They were doing fine until they almost got to the grave, which is about maybe another half a mile. All of a sudden, the men boys couldn't carry it anymore. And the cough, that coffin became so heavy that they couldn't move. They had to drop the coffin. So when they dropped the coffin down, they began to wonder. How come all of a sudden she was so heavy? So some of them, they began to curse it. What's the matter with you? Why you want to do this? You're supposed to go. We're supposed to take you to your ground. You don't bury you. Forget the past. And oh, things like that went on. So finally, one of the persons said, I don't think she wants to go any further unless she has her favorite grandson, her favorite. And her favorite, because she had, oh, she raised my brother. She raised my brother. Um, his name was Kiahi. And so we had to call him. So Kiahi came. He was way in the back, played with other kids on the way. I was like, Kiahi, come over. So Kiahi came up ahead, wondering what was going on. So they told him, you go in the front of the coffin with two men, with two, two men. My grandfather was leaving himself. Okay? No, was that my grandfather with my uncle? So when he went, when they lifted the coffin, the coffin was light, much lighter than what it was when they carried. So with that, with my brother leading the way, going ahead, they got to the coffin safely. Up to the mountain, everything was set up, and came to the ground, to the hole. Okay? That's one part of it. 
Could you tell the story about um, the fireball that you saw? Oh, which place about the hole? Oh. In those days when they dig the hole, you know, today we have concrete kicks. Those days they have, we used what you call a corrugated iron. They put the, they lay the corrugated iron roof down the bottom, then they have this, then they put the coffin, then they have this other corrugated iron on the side, and they would cover, they would cover the coffin with this corrugated iron, the corrugated iron. And of course, before they, before they even fill up the coffin with dirt, people would throw the flowers or the dirt or the rocks into the grave. But you know those days, when a person dies, all his belongings goes with him. All his clothing and this is clothes, all the clothing. Nothing is left in the bag for somebody else to wear. Okay, so that's covered. Okay. Now what else? Could you tell a story about the fireball that you saw? Oh, that fireball story. You know, during those days, there's so many different stories that you hear that are ah, superstitious. But anyway, this one day, every evening, it is the customers. We eat early, and we go to bed early. We go to bed early. Before it gets dark, all the kids are in bed already. All the kids are in bed already. And only the adults are sitting on the porch talking stories. Only the adults on the porch talking stories. So this one evening, and while they were sitting on the porch, I happened to be up at that time. I was, and then I heard my grandmother and my grandfather, oh, look, there's this fireball, all in the water. And this rocket, just like a firecracker or rocket, going across, across the, over the sky. And then he saw this fireball landed on, on this one house, and it broke up, just like how the firecracker is going to break up, exactly like that. I saw that, oh, what a wonderful thing it was. And, oh, what was that? Somebody shooting fireworks. Okay, little did I know that this was what they called the fireball. And the Hawaiians believe that when you see this thing, wherever it lands, wherever it lands, the people of that house is going to have some kind of misfortune. And the next day, the man of that house had passed away that night. Now, we, I don't know whether he had been sick or what, but the next day, uh, what you call, he was uh, dead. I mean, he was told that he died that night. And of course, you know, my grandmother and my grandfather said, oh, they saw the warning sign to this fireball. But to me, it was like a fireworks. <laughs> Although I don't know what this fireworks is. <laughs> Could you tell us a story about the mermaid? Ah, again, you see how superstitious the Hawaiians are. You know, as we got older, you sit down and you listen to the old folks tell stories. Now, we have a favorite pond, and it's, it's called Waiokalea. It's two great big ponds with a road running in between. On the marker side, on the mountain side, the pond there is kind of shallow. And that's where the mothers usually bathe their little ones, so the little ones learn to, to, to swim. But on the other side, which is closer to the beach side, it's deep there, and that's just where we swim. And it's quite a big, huge pond. And right alongside of this, there's poor holler trees, love holler trees growing. So there's a couple of these love holler trees that's growing right in this water, but in the shallow part, right? And it's, it's a quite a big tree with a nice leaning branch. And so the story goes that people say they see this mermaid sitting on this branch here. And she would be cold in her hair. And to us kids, we would be so fascinated we hear this kind of story, you know. And so we say, well, this, this lady, she, is, she takes care of the farm. Now they didn't tell her what is her duty. Only they said that she is a lady of this pond. But we have never seen this kind. 
And the people said, she's a beautiful lady with long hair, and she has a, a tail like a fish. What about the mo'o that you saw? And then there's another, what you call, the keeper of that pond is called the mo'o. It's a, it's a, a lizard, you know? It's and this lizard here, the mall, he is what you call the keeper of this place of God and Strong. And in this story here, my grandmother always tells us, when you first go swimming, if we don't dirty the water, don't contaminate the water, don't shishi in the water, yeah? or not even to make doo-doo in the water. <laughs> but we never do that. Yeah? But if you make shishi, then this mall is going to bite you, it's going to harm you. So, because they always told us that we cannot, it's got shishi in the water. Because of the mo, we're pretty good about that. We'd be scared, yeah? When you want to make shishi, you get out of the water and you go make shishi someplace else. But never in the water. But little do I realize, that's how we kept our water clean. And the parents, you know, there's one way of ruling tell us by putting fear in us. If we're going to weave in, she's in the water, we're going to get her. Okay, well, I don't know this about this one. Well, one day, you know, as I got older, the boys and thought the boys wanted to have a competition. They said, oh, let's race between the boys and the girls. <laughs> and the girls knew that we cannot win, that the boys are all big boys and they're all good swimmers. So because they come nagging us and teasing us how weak we are, it's so funny and the girl said, okay, we take out the theater, we we'll race with you guys. So the boys line up one side and the girls one side. And so they would come in Hawaii, Kahi, Lua, Ekul, Hola, it means one, two, three, go. So if you hear the word Hola, you die. Okay, all well, that day was kind of, the water was, it was kind of deep that day. So anyway, here, all of us jump into the water, swimming across, and here I was swimming. Pretty soon I used to see another water, I see this crocodile, this mole in, in the water. And it, it is body, and his feet, and his tail, and the head in the front. Boy, if I was as scared when I saw this shadow there, and one time I gave one, two, I think three or four strokes on my hand. I was over on the other side already. Oh, how scared I was. You can imagine how scared I was. Boy, I was splashing in the water and I got across. I had to wait a little while. Pretty soon the boys came. And they saw me standing on the other side. They, said, they were so surprised, you know. And then now I'm going to say, oh, come here for you, go on, I said. So all I can say was, we won. But when they look at me, you know, those days you were dark, we were brown babies, not like now. Oh, in other words, you look just like uh, colored people those days, real dark, 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 dark brown. <laughs> Instead of being brown, I look white, they said, I was so, my face here. Yeah? So I couldn't say anything else, I just said that we won. So I ran home. And when I was running home, I got home, my grandmother says, What's wrong? What happened? Uh, and I was panicking, I said, Oh, you know Tutu? He said, Yeah. What is it? Oh, I saw a bull. Saw a bull in the water. And the bull was chasing after me. I know. Mo. Yeah. So, so she said, what were you for me doing? And I said, well, the boys wanted to race with us, with the girls. So we did. So we are free. And so she says, ah, oh, that's why the Mo came. Mo came to help the girls win. If it wasn't for this Mo, the folks wouldn't have won it. Because you were so scared with this more, you just went right on and uh, and that's how you folks won. The more was helping. <laughs> and I said, no, Grandma, that's not right. Said, no, he was helping you. Your more loved you, so <laughs> he took care of you. And I said, oh, no. 
So for several days, I refused to go to school. And then, you know, as I got older, because I didn't know everything was superstitious. That must have been my shadow in the water. <laughs> as I swim, the things fell with me, yeah? <laughs> and my grandmother said, no, that's the more. Could you tell the story about um, when your father got lost at sea? Oh, yeah, that's another story. You know, my once in a while, when they know that certain certain run of the fish, you know, certain time of the year, there's a run of a certain kind of fish. And so, people those days, if you go out canoeing, and when you come back, all the people down at the canoe landing, it, they get whatever you have. If you have plenty of fish, well, maybe you get two, three, or one. If you don't have much fish, maybe at least one per person. Even if you bring a baby, the baby gets a share. But they believe that if you don't share what you have, what you caught, the next time when you go out fishing, you will never get nothing. So they always, and whatever is left, they usually sell whatever is left. Not to make money, but it's to buy their supplies, like they need the trade, they need to patch the net when they have big holes there. So that's what they use it for. And if they have extra, then they buy a little a bottle of, 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 of koleha or something like that, where they can all enjoy themselves. You know. But usually it's to buy the material. Well, this one day, my my um, father and two uncles, one was his brother and one was my mother's brother, they went out fishing. They didn't come home that night. So the family wasn't too concerned. They missed one night. So all the next day, they waited and waited, and they would come home, it was getting dark already, going to the second day out. By that time, the whole village was down the canoe landing, waiting for them to come, waiting for the other side of them. We even built one fire, one fire, one fire, so that they could see. But they didn't see that river. Okay, so this was their second night out. Early the next morning, they thought, well, they didn't know what direction they were going in. Even the currents wasn't even helping them. They saw this great big shelf heading for their, for their canoe. When they saw this shelf, this shelf is just as long as their canoe. When they saw this shelf, they picked up their, their hole, I mean, their paddle, and they started to beat this, this uh, shark. But the shark didn't go away. You know how the canoe is there, one side of the arm, while the shark was on the other side. They threw all the fish into the water, thinking that maybe the, the shark was hungry. So they threw the fish overboard. He wouldn't even eat it. So they struggled with this, with this shark over here, and they beat him up until they only have one good paddle left. The other paddles are all broken. So they said, oh, that's the one. They thought, well, this, this shark doesn't want to eat fish. He wants to eat human beings. So he's going to turn this, this what you call, the shark, the canoe over, and he's going to have a big feast. This is what they were talking to themselves. This is, this is the end of us. Of course, before that, you know, before the end of that, they were kind of forgiving one another time. Oh, you know, when I was this, I did this, I did this, I betrayed my wife, and I did this, you know. So all the stars was coming out what they did, you know, trying to clear their conscience before the shark, before the shark even eat them, that's the thing. But in the meantime, the shark was bumping them, you know, bumping them. But the idea, when the shark is bumping them, they think, the shark wants to overturn the canoe. <laughs> so anyway, this, this shark keep bumping them. 
So what did they do for about an hour, more than an hour? No, Finally, they realized that Disha didn't want to hurt them, that he was doing something to help them. So they gave up there, just let her come. So they said, Pretty soon, they could see the mountain. They could see land where the mountain was. Nobody could see the mountain. Then they realized that this shop was helping to direct the moon. So they let the shop go there, the shop was bumping them, bumping them, until they came pretty close to land, where the people saw, saw them out here. Yeah? Some of the canoes started going out, you know, to meet them. But the shop came very close until they got pretty close to the house, and the shop left. The shop left. Well, you can you can see the relief when they shop there. So by the time you know people were there, one canoe went out to try to greet them. You know they could come in. In order to come in those days over there, you cannot come in any old time. You have to stay out at a certain distance, and you wait for the waves. The seven waves. The first wave is a small one, and it keep going, and it builds up, builds up. On the sixth wave, when the six, six big waves come out, and that goes down, then the people, you know, on the, on the land, we say, get ready for the next big one. And by that time, you ride on by this next big wave. So the canoe come right on with this big seven wave, and you ride on the tip of that canoe, on that wave, and it brings you right into the harbor. And you know, as far back as I can remember, there's Five big rocks, cliff like, you know, rocks on both sides. And the space to come in is just enough for one cow, for one canoe to come in with the armor. Just enough. No, no bigger, no smaller, but enough. Okay. So, anyway, with this, the steersman, all he does is just steer this canoe. So, when he steers in his canoe, the, the canoe comes right into his land. And his way would take him right up, halfway up into the landing. And as soon as he gets into the canoe, the landing, people over there on the, on the canoe land will grab the canoe because if you don't grab it fast enough, the wave can pull you back out in the receding wave. Pull you back. And so that's how the canoes were brought in those days. I've never seen an accident. But anyway, when my father first got out to the house, oh, there was so much rejoicing, so much rejoicing. Oh, everybody, my mother was so happy. Everybody thought they were a philosopher. And then they told the story about this fish. And these ladies start telling this story. They used to tease one another. Hey, you remember the story that you were telling us? <laughs> And then the women for they caught on to what they said the British soon you know, the secrets are coming out. <laughs> okay, let's follow the story then. Could you tell a story when you when you got sick when you were a baby and had to go to the, go to the kahuna? And you what? Could you tell a story when you got sick when you were a baby? Yeah. And had to go to the kahuna? Oh, well, that was in regards to my name. When I got real sick. You see, when my mother and father, when my mother and father, before they got married, they made a compromise. If there's any girl that's going to be born, my mother's side would give the name. And if it's a boy, then my father's side would name the, name the child. Okay. So I was born. My father gave me his mother's name, which is Kalili. Okay. So I was okay until after about seven, going on to eight years old. I became very, very ill. I became very ill on the verge of dying. So they went to the kahuna. 
Where do the kahuna and the tribe do everything sometimes as well? This girl's problem lies between the folks. No outsiders, but it's this. So they couldn't imagine what they did to me. They thought of everything else where they didn't beat me up or they don't buy things that I want. They didn't hit the point, they didn't solve the point. So my grandmother said, she's the one who always seems to remember this. Did you folks make some kind of compromise that when the, when the baby is born, oh, when my grandmother mentioned that, my father clicked. He said, yeah, that's right. He said, I am at fault. Right there, he admitted that he was at fault because I was a girl and he named me. He named me, gave me his mother's name. And I had no, he had no business to do that. It was supposed to be on my mother's side, supposed to give the name. And because of that, the Kahuna said, yeah, that was right. That was the biggest problem, that they went against the compromise of property. Yeah, they, that he had broken their promise, they didn't keep up with it. So what he had to do, he had to forgive himself, he had to uh, get, uh, take that name out of me, so, I was no longer Kalili, and the only thing that will save me is on my mother's side. And so that's how my mother, my grandmother gave me that name that I have today, which is called Kaino Kupuna, Kavahini Aikohaku Kupuna. Could you say it louder? Okay, the name is Kaino Kupuna. And what does that mean? That means, as a name from the kupuna, aipohaku means each stone of puna. I mean, literally translated is the lady who eat, the lady who eat rocks or the lady who eat stones. So there's no other person that does that but Pele. You know, when she flows, eh, she's, she's eating up. She's flowing with lava rocks there, eh? and then she eats the land. She eats the land. So my name is in regards to Pele. Kawahini Aipohaku Opuna, the lady who eats rocks of Puna. In other words, she's known as Pele. So, you know, my Kapuna always say that Pele is, is our tutu. You know? something like a thought to us, that we should respect her. In any line of form that we should respect her. She made the land. If she wants to take the land away from us, that's her business. That's what they always say. So my name today is no longer Kalili, but the old timers, those that know me then, like my aunt, she always called me Kalili, some other family would call me Kalili. But my name actually is Kaino. And I hardly use my Hawaiian name Kaino until I started working at the at the Koolau Boys Home. I worked at the Koolau Boys Home. It's a, it's a correctional school there. And one day, one of these men, he was a, he was a clerk in there. And I could walk and he said, Hi, Kainoa. See, I looked around, I said, There's only my family called me that name, nobody else, Kainoa. So he said, Hi, Kainoa, he called me again. So I said, Did you just call me? He said, Yeah. Isn't that your name, Kainoa? I said, Yeah, that's my name. How did you get that name? Oh, through your record. Isn't that right? I said, yeah. But you know, only my family calls me that name. So he said, oh, that's a beautiful name. Why don't you use that name? I said, nah, that's a one. <laughs> so little by little, that name came out. And then even the workers, when they found out that my name was Kainoa, they said, hey, Kainoa, how are you, Kainoa? And they know that I don't like that, yeah? And they, because they think that I don't like it. I was, hey, Kaino, how are you? What are you doing today? How are you? 
how's your boys? You know, they tease me and ask me for that. And even my cousin Lena from that time was a kind of, everything was kind of, and pretty soon it was kind of. And then when I got hired in the Hawaiian Studies program, they said they were, they used the Hawaiian name instead of Agnes. So I know to me, most everybody know the old time is known as kind of. Could you tell the story when um, you went to go offer Pele stones in her um, pit? Oh my God, that okay. I come up. It's about Pele, and these is two stories that happened to me. Yes, I don't know, I forgot what year it was. Hey, it was not too long ago, 1960. Anyway. She was erupting, really erupting up at volcano. And it's about, oh, 30, 40 miles away from where we live for her. So a group of us decided that we were going to go to the volcano. So my mother said, don't go. Well, I dressed up, dressed up, and I had my uh, pretty black print dress. And this fella had a model T for so we all got on this model T for this lady in the evening and we went up. By the time we got there, it was dark here. Yeah. When we got to the pit, there was no fire, no nothing at all. Not even a trace of red. So we waited around for about half an hour. So by that time, young kids, I said, yeah, call us those days. We didn't know what was wrong. We didn't know what was wrong. How do you say that? But anyway, he said, oh, kids. We began to cuss it, and all oh, this old lady, which is not even burning, we come all the way from there, not even one flame. So we left, we left, we came home. And when we came home, and then my mother said, oh, how was the fire? So I said, oh, then that old lady, <laughs> so, uh, that old lady never even light up for us. She was a mocking her fire, I told her, she was mocking. And my mother <laughs> said, mocking? You go out and look, she's, she's what you call sparking up over there, look at the flame. She went out, I went out on the porch, you know, and look up and hey, that sky was red up there. And so I said, who is there? Not even one black spot, no more fire. Down this old lady. <laughs> so my mother said, ah, something you folks did. That she paid a hoo hoo with you folks, that she was mad with you folks, that she didn't show up. So we said, What did we do? Nothing. We didn't do anything wrong. We didn't take any whiskey. We didn't take any. Oh, maybe because we didn't take any whiskey for her, yeah, so maybe she mad. And she said, I don't know. And she says, Which of you girls is sick? I said, Say, what do you mean sick? I thought, sick, you know, you want a fever or what? She said, no. One of you has been, has been menstruating, yeah? So I said, oh, me? She said, oh, that's why. She said, you were donated. We contaminate the place there. And she don't like that. So I said, oh, how I was to know? How was I to know? And, but things like that. She said, I do kapuru. Well, they don't like unclean people, and that's why she didn't spark up for you. I said, oh, really? So that's all. Uh, so she told me, you should forgive yourself. I said, forgive myself for things like that. She said, you better forgive yourself for that, that you are wrong for doing it. I said, how should I know? <laughs> how should I know? But anyway, I listened to her. I said, okay, 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 I'm sorry the next time. And she said, the next time when you first go, if you're unwell, would take a tea leaf, or say tea leaf. Okay, that's one is, and that's a true fact. Another, another is in the Vatskeri. My grand, I had an uncle who works up at the Volcano Ranch. They have a cattle ranch over there, and so every so often we would go and spend the weekend with that uncle of ours because he wants my grandma and my grandpa to come. Where my grandma goes, I go too with my younger brother. So some evenings we go down to the, around the, the rim and have uh, dinner 
you know, we take our boy, our jerk meat, or whatever we see. Before we even sit down to eat, my grandma or my grandpa, they have a bottle of whiskey. And they would mumble, jumble some stuff, you know, they'd oli or chant, and they would throw this bottle into the fire pit. Oh, those days everybody do that. When you go out to visit her, you have to throw it in some kind of a gift. But us kids, we have five cents each, five cents. So my mother and grandmother gives me this ah. You throw both two, two, okay? I throw all my two, two. And now up comes the one, then she bubbles up, you know, and my two, two says, I see. The two, two says, Mahalo. The two, two says, Thank you for, for, for your gift. And then I said, Oh, happy power. Then I'm not sitting, we'll do the same thing, you know. You know my, yeah, my younger brother will do the same thing. And again, we'll bubble up. So my two, two say, Ah, oh, my. Kai, that's good. She said, thank you. I come to my oldest brother. I said, ah, your time now to throw. Well, we saw him the motion of throwing. Yeah, I was throwing, throwing the motion. No more, no more bubble. Nothing came up. So Tutu says, what did you do? Did you really throw your money in? And he said, yeah, I threw my money in. I don't know what's the matter with that old lady, you know, she, and she, and my two kids say, don't you talk like that about you two, too. Okay, so he asked, did you really throw your money? He said, yeah, I did. But well, how come Pele didn't throw? How come she didn't throw? So anyway, he said, she said, let's, well, let's see what you have in your pocket. So he reached in his pocket, there comes up and he comes. Ah, oh, so my tutu said, you throw that money inside the fire pit, that's for her, okay? So reluctantly, you know, he throw his money inside the pit, you know, so And you know, instead of a small bubble, big burst, yeah, had a big burst. So my tutu said, ah, oh, you see, your tutu said, ah, oh, mahalo, and she forgive you. She said, you know, she said, no, she know you naughty boy, but she, she loves you, you big spread. No, I do ask you to go, oh, because she got the biggest spread that we did here. And so my tutu said, ah, the tutu said, Aloha, well, I love you, thank you for your money. <laughs> so that's it, that's real, real. But to me, oh, it's, Jam up the story. So we had these all coincidences, yeah? The right thing bubbles every now and then, but it just so happens when I throw, the thing bubbles off. Because indeed, now how can the money reach down the body? Probably the money go right by the side of the, uh, of the mountain, yeah? <laughs> my tutu makes it real. She says, ah, oh, you see, your money went down. Ah, oh, you see? Pause, she says, she burst up in flame. But my brother's one was a great big one. Yeah, bigger than they used to And then we go and sit down and eat. And it's warm, it's warm. We see right in the dark, but with that glare, you know, the fire, it kind of lights up the place. And then we go home. That's it. What about the story when you were sick and you went up there? Yeah. And Pele, um, yeah, I did say that's when I was unwell. She didn't flare up. No, I thought I thought there was a story when um, she spit the rock back up. No, I think that was the message in my brother's one. Oh. No, 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 no. Okay, thank you, Kupuna. You're welcome. Some of the stories are. <laughs>